What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a special weekly recap edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. It is Saturday, April 20th, 2024. I am your humble correspondent, Michael Tanner. We had a great week, folks. A lot of great stories we covered. I mean, I couldn't even be, I can't even begin to describe the stories we covered because they were so plentiful. Um, so I'm just going to let it kick over and let the team fire it up. As always, guys, the news and analysis you're about to hear is brought to you by the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. Check us out there. We have a lot of cool stuff coming up. Thank you for checking out, as always, the podcast. Visit us on energynewsbeat.com. But I'm going to go ahead and just lay it up, give it up to the team, and we will be out of here. See you on Monday, folks. EVs head for junkyard as mechanic shortage inflates repair costs. Holy smokes, Batman. There's some nuggets in this article, Michael. And that is, uh, I'm, I'm about to break my arm for the podcast listeners. I can't even pull my hand up over my shoulder. I'm so sore from working in the garden, but I am patting myself on the back as best I can, because this article says insurance companies are driving the price of, uh, EVs uh, through the roof. And I think that it's not going to be the government. It's not going to be demand. It's not, it's going to be the insurance companies that are going to take them out let's go through some of these numbers here um fewer than 10 percent of the uk's 236 auto mechanics are qualified to work directly on the ev batteries or their cases uh while many technicians can perform less demanding tasks the most challenging repairs require extra training and michael the batteries you get a crack a little water on one and they become a fire hazard. <laughs> I love this side. Uh, a, a trainer. Uh, this is a quote from Darren Noddington. He's an AA trainer, not alcohols anonymous, but uh, um, another, <laughs> another type. He says, quote, it's instant death on these systems. Oh yeah. Um, I, I do want to give a shout out to my father-in-law. He was in West Texas um, uh, this past week and he did. There are no chargers. He had to park his car, walk a mile and a half back to the, you know, fr uh, from the, ho to the hotel yeah. and then go back a mile and a half. He didn't have a Uber and didn't have anybody around. And so, you know, if you're two, three miles away from a, uh, and he's 85, you know, and yeah. he loves his Tesla, but. Gee. No, Teslas are cool. I think it's interesting, Miss Producer, if you don't mind sh throwing up this chart here. It looks like it's from Bloomberg. UK sales of battery electric cars have gone stagnant. <laughs> you see, no one's buying them anymore. No, they can't. And uh, that big spike in December of 2022, is that tax incentives? Is yes. that Does that oh, weave in some yes. tax incentives that they're trying to squeeze out in the UK before the end of the year? Yep. And now tax incentives, because of the Biden administration... And the way they've been defining in a moving target on tax incentives, A, you got to make X number of dollars, which eliminates most of the middle class now. And then most of the cars may or may not have gotten much of a tax deduction. I, I covered a little bit of that earlier, and it it's crazy how stupid they are. They want to sell these things. And then China. Let me just say this about China. China is dumping all of their inventories and they're building fabs in Europe. They're building a fab in Mexico and they're going to be, excuse me, whore dogging like a son of a gun. Uh, this is a family show, but a whore dogging we can say, right? So um, they're going to be really moving those things out like uh, people on the street. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's they, they're able to produce a low uh, a quality piece of equipment, theoretically, at a lower cost on the market. People are going to flock to it if they are. If you do want to get into the EV business, you're either buying a Tesla or you're buying a Chinese made product. It, right. There's really no in between. That's really what it's come down to at this point. And I believe in Elon and I believe in the Teslas. And I think that they're great for those people that can afford them. Water scarcity and clean energy collide in South Texas. Michael, this is really pretty funny because this is a weird story. 
and increased water drawn slowly, slowly from the uh, Nucus River system could dramatically increase the potential for scarcity, wrote Corpus Christi's director of intergovernmental relations, Ryan. I'm going to butcher his name and I apologize. Uh, I'm not sure what that was. March 1st memo to the state lawmakers and a first reported the Corpus Christi caller times. A new large volume of user Nucus River will require extensive and exact monitoring to avoid increased drought. All this is over renewable uh, hydrogen and hydrogen, as you and I have talked, uh, is not easily transported. So they're going to convert it to ammonia, <laughs> which requires a lot more energy. So hydrogen requires a lot of water and a lot of um uh, energy, and then you got to have more energy in order to turn it into ammonia so you can transport it, and that's a whole different set of in infrastructure. Uh, unbelievable. In the future, hydrogen will be used to replace diesel, diesel, said Joel Powell, director of the Energy Transition Institute at the University of Houston and a former chief scientist at Shell. They probably ran him out. Uh, I'll see that is a good jobs transition. I just don't see it, Michael. I just think it's pretty funny. Yeah, I it 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 comes down to what we talked about last week with Chat GPT. Every time you type in a little phrase, boom, fifty milliliters of water gone. So as we transition, quote unquote, into a clean fossil fuel future, what happens with water? I mean, I think that's it's been on the back burner. No one's talking about water. California's had a um, unusual higher rainfall. So I think there we aren't really talking about it. But just five years ago, everybody was on water, 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 water. So what does that mean? Does that mean that the water supply is now fixed? No, it's a it, it fluctuates yearly. But moving to this type of technology, specifically with this hydrogen, is a little weird, Stu. I mean, Letting them take the last available water supply from a South Texas, the South Texas region, not good. No, and listen to this quote. Uh, this is from Pete, uh, Corpus Christi City Council uh, City Manager Peter Zioni uh, warned that the Aviana project could increase water prices to all city users. Quote, the loss of millions of gallons of water a day will have an impact on our water supplies. To backfill that will potentially result in rate impacts to all Corpus Christi, wa Corpus Christi water customers, I only wrote. That's terrible. Yeah, and local residents are now under water use restrictions. So again, yeah. it's you taking it in the drive through folks. Yeah, you know, as um, in... Uh, uh, die, uh, wasn't die hard. It was a uh, uh, lethal weapon. What's next for oil? Analyst weigh in on after uh, after the attack. I'm going to go through about four or five different really key analysts and their uh, prediction of what is possible. Hundred dollars is possible from Citigroup quote unquote, what is not priced into the current market in our view is potential continuation of a direct conflict between Iran and Israel, which we estimate could see prices trade up well above a hundred uh, barrels per day, depending on the nature of the events. Um, and so let's go to Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs risk premium. Uh, they, this is a quote unquote, we estimate that the price oil prices already reflect a five to $10 barrel risk premium from downside risk to supply before the weekend attacks, uh, Goldman Sachs said analyst, including Dan, uh, Struvian, uh, said to note potential Israeli response to uh, Iran's attack is highly uncertain and will likely determine the extent of the threat to the oil supply. So you can see how this is kind of formulating in lots of great stuff right here. Watch for po possible response from ICG. They're saying that Iran has been signaling that this was it. 
the next story that I'm about to talk about kind of says, oh, it's not. So, um, and then we can guide uh, another group, ING group says it's already priced in. Uh, RBC says to the shadows in response, uh, this is a quote, in such a scenario, we think the risk to oil is not insignificant given the Iranian seizure of the vessel in the Strait of Hormuz, um, but it's predicted that the missile and drone attacks uh, could, if Israel stands down or carries out a demineous response, it seems that Iran might very well take the opportunity to return this war to the shadows. Uh, that means uh, attacking through uh, foreign uh, countries or third parties. Here's where, uh, and Miss Producer, if you could bring this up forward, uh, the graphic. This is a graphic uh, showing uh, it's the Energy Information Administration Inter International Energy Statistics and the world's biggest oil producers in 2023. Take a look at this. United States is 12.9%. Then you have um, Canada at 4.6, Russia at 10.1, Saudi Arabia at 9.7. Now, here's part of the reason the Saudis at 9.7. They could blow this number out of the water for the U.S., but they are holding back because of their leadership in OPEC, and they don't really need to. Iraq, critical point, 4.3 million barrels per day. That's a lot. And if you take 4.3 million barrels a day off the market, if Israel responds and as Lindsey Graham has said, he wants to do if there was a way to hit the Iranian oil fields and you take a significant portion of that, I think it's going to be all bets on uh, off on oil because it could take quite a uh, quite a ways to build that up. China is 4.2, but they're importing a ton. Brazil is 3.4, and they're not ready to uh, expand back out. So uh, the other is other countries, and don't know that they have the capacities to bring that forward. This article does not go into some of the hidden geopolitical things that are about LNG. In a, uh, I'm going to start with the first paragraph here. Deputies of the Tur uh, Turkish parliament after a month and a half a break caused by local elections will resume their legislative activity on April 16th. One of the most important documents they will consider is a bill allowing the sale of natural gas imported by the Republic in liquefied form LNG in a source in a parliamentary uh, circles told T-A-S-S. -S. Quote, the approval of the bill will be one of the most important steps to create a legislative flame, uh, framework to transform Turkey into an international gas trading center. Holy smokes. This is going to have about three or four orders of magnitude of impact. While it may slide by a lot of the mainstream media, it may slide by a lot. I guarantee you, we're going to be looking at energynewsbeat.co at this. Uh, Miss Producer, if you could bring up the map. Uh, this is a map of uh, the pretty much the Middle East, Mediterranean, and uh, other areas. You can see Turkey dead center in the, in the center. And there are pipelines rolling through, uh, just regular uh, gas pipelines and oil pipelines. And then if you look at the center on uh, the one side of it, uh, on the left-hand side of Turkey, there's a n numeral number two. That is an LNG import facility. What that means is you see the, the gas can go flow up to Bulgaria. It can flow all the way down into Syria. It can flow all the way over and 
and then it can actually hit in the southern part and roll over to Greece. Greece will have another connecting point and be able to come in from the Cyprus, which is number 10, which is an import facility as well. And if you import from it, you can export from it. And as you come into Israel and Egypt, Egypt is now a mix between importing and exporting, depending on the amount of natural gas coming from the Leviathan field in the Mediterranean. This is a very complicated issue, and a second order of magnitude is sanctions being placed on any kind of, uh, let's say, cutter. Let's say we play uh, the government, not we, but the government, the U.S. government put sanctions on Russia's LNG. Here's a loophole. Because they could drop off LNG at Turkey and it would go into gas pipelines in there. So there are many ways that sanctions can be bypassed once LNG is now offloaded. LNG does not have the dark fleet such as or the gray fleet, however you want to uh, pronounce it. But Russia has increased their energy exports through LNG and through uh, oil using the dark fleet, avoiding sanctions. This one may be a very large sanction uh, avoidance scheme, uh, if you would. Uh, world leaders urge restraint as Israel mulls Iran's response. Michael, I, I, this goes along with the next article, why oil markets are calm despite Iran's. Uh, yeah, I want you to tangent. rant on this for a bit. I, I, I'm a little weirded out, dude, honestly. I mean, you and I have talked about this for years, ever since you and I were going to have our own tanker fleet. We were going to fill oil in our own because as soon as, you know, something happens. Uh, I don't get this. And Iran's foreign ministry said on Monday, it does not seek further escalation in the Middle East. Yesterday and uh, yesterday afternoon, Iran, uh, I, Israel is now saying they are going to um, attack. Now, if they attack their nuclear fleet, what does that mean? Do they attack their uh, oil oil fields and their export facilities? That's something different. Are they going to uh, attack something else? All of it, I have no clue. But uh, yesterday I covered, there's about five different analysts. Are you there, Michael? Are you? Oh, I'm broke? listening. Oh, okay. There's five different analysts, uh, Goldman Sachs and all these guys, and they all came out with different answers. And, and, and so... Why I think everybody, and this is my personal opinion, why everybody is calm right now is because nobody has any idea yep. how bad it could get. I mean, think about it. We had Iran throw a record number of missiles. Uh, they were shot down by the Iron Dome and 1%, two people were killed, Michael, and it was because one of the Iranian, two Iranian missiles blew up in iran they misfired so they got zero people one young girl was hurt that's pretty bad for 330 missiles that's bad yeah i mean the the, the quote from the israeli government spokesperson david menser quote we reserve the right to do everything in our power and we will do everything in our power to defend this country um it it it, it can't be fun to look up in your skies and see the, I mean, the, the fact that you have to fire off the Iron Dome is probably very scary. And I can only imagine what those people are going through oh, over there. Our hearts and prayers go out to Yeah, you walk outside, you just see, I mean, you know, you see a billion dollars just being exploded over the top of your uh, country is, is, is never good. You know, I, there's a lot of missiles. 300 missiles is big. I, I think from, from oil standpoint, I think a lot of this – price action was already priced in. Remember, Iran right. telegraphed this 72 hours prior, and we saw the run-up based upon that, the rumor. What do you say? Buy the rumor, sell the news. 
There's a reason for that. You know, I think people yep. were woefully with, you know, with, with, with call options on, on Sunday night were woefully missed, uh, you know, were un- not woefully, but were woke up, unfortunately not too pumped because, you know, oil was pretty much flat. Cause again, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't want to get into the geopolitical analysis of this, but it seems pretty obvious that Iran wanted everybody to know what happened so that nobody came back and really took them out because they're nervous that they could actually get wiped off the face of the earth. So there, the, there's, there's three things people need to look at. Iran sent out video of Chile's fire that was devastating and said, this is what we did to Iran. I mean, uh, Israel. So let me rephrase, say that again. Iran put out on their TV a, fil- a film of a forest fire saying this was a result of their thing to their citizens. So that's a, a big thing going, whoops. Um, and then you have Biden, you have Mary Marjorie Taylor Green coming out and saying that Biden approved Iran and told them it was OK to bomb Israel. I'm like, and there's about four other people that have done that as well. So Biden is saying don't. And then he's saying, OK. And then he's telling Israel, uh, don't retaliate and we're not going to be there. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't think he knows what he's thinking. That's no, scary. I mean, I think it's uh, it, it's going to be interesting. I do think, you know, from again, to try to tie it back to what's going on in energy. I think a lot of this stuff has been priced in. I think, yes, the next move, though, we're, you're not going to be able to price in the next move because I don't think it's going to be telegraphed. I don't think there's going to be a 72 hour head warning. Hey, we're going to do this. First, with Larry Fink lashes out at BlackRock's political critics, quote, they continuously lie. Reading straight from the article here, um, you know, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink has, quote, lashed out at political critics of the world's largest money matter in new combative comments Friday, saying, again, quote, they continuously lie. These remarks come as the firm continually faces heat from hot-button political fights around this country. Here's the quote from the first quarter earnings call. We have we have done a better job now of telling our stories so that people can make decisions based on facts, not lies, and not on misinformation or politicalization by others. Uh, he goes on to say, unfortunately, there are still out there who continuously lie about these comments. Obviously, what he's referring to is Texas doing a lot of their the tanks, the Texas political or uh, oh gosh, it's the Texas, I think, teacher pension fund that pulled out. Uh, a few weeks ago and basically said, hey, we're not going to continue to invest with you. He lashed out specifically then to tell them, hey, we don't like that. You know, they they came out with this big press release saying, you know, we like to, you know, we're not a, quote, woke investor. Um, but he's been, BlackRock has continually been cast by the Republicans as a, quote, unquote, purveyor of woke investing. And what I find funny and what I think You know, Larry Fink, you know, we've done a bad job of educating. Well, yeah, if you go back and read your last two yearly investor letters, you know, letters that you write to investors, it's chock full of stuff that says we need to transition. We need to go to ESG. We need to be do sustainable investing, ESG investing. You're the ones with all those funds. You're also the ones that are still investing in oil and gas. So, sure, you may not be investing in oil and gas, but you're miss you my friend, are misrepresenting exactly then what your investment strategy is. If you're telling people you're investing in ESG, quote-unquote ESG funds, but it's really all being pumped into oil and gas companies. It's not us that's spreading the misinformation. It's you, Mr. Fink, that's spreading the misinformation. So I think he needs to kind of look inward a little bit versus outward and say, what are we doing here? And, you know, we know it's not an education problem on your end. It's a you need to have a different PR strategy, because if you're going to invest in oil and gas, you're going to have a hard time passing it as often as an ESG. But if you do, you're the one that's lying. So that's my that's my call to Larry Fink. You need to be more honest and upfront with people that you're after you're, you're after fees. The more money you can raise, the more fees you can charge. And and that's really all what it is. I mean, the game's not hard. They want to raise more money. The more money they manage, the more fees they get. So if they feel like there's a sector of the economy that's stopping, that's going to stop investing money in them, a.k.a. the pension funds, blah, that's less fees. I mean, I know that second home in Florida is expensive, okay? But 
we can all we 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 can be honest and get the second home at the same time. Maybe the fourth level isn't needed. Maybe you don't need the indoor ice rink in Palm Beach. You can maybe live without that and just start using the rec center. But you know, wouldn't want to bump into anybody who might call you out on ESG of it. So I find Larry Fink's position here kind of hilarious. You know, I love the if we can you know misproduce it, we can throw up the uh, the cover image on this. I love this little. Um, look, he's got going on here. Of course, he's sitting at the Clinton Global Global Initiative, so we we won't even have to talk about that. Um, but that's my that's my call to Mr. Fink. I do not believe you're the one or you are the one spreading all of this information. Not necessarily everybody else spreading it about you. I think you need to be a little bit more upfront about exactly what you're doing because if you come out and say you're investing in oil and gas, all those people that you're trying to raise money from on the Democratic side aren't going to like you. So you can't have your cake and eat it too, my friend. At some point, you have to have morals. This is a, a, an interesting you know, conundrum of, you know, Larry Fink's got no morals because his morals is money. If, if Having morals means you have to say no to things. And if you're not willing to say no to things, it just means you're after the money. So that's really my, my push here. I think everybody who listens to this podcast know that Larry Fink's talking about both sides of the mouth. But if by chance somebody who doesn't know much about what BlackRock does listen to this, it's the problems with BlackRock, not the problem with the way we're interpreting their information. <laughs> Oh, my God.